Yeah. On behalf of Emmanuel Christian Seminary at Milligan, we welcome you to this third lecture um, in our Hayden uh, series. We once again want to thank Hopwood Christian Church for their hospitality. And I also want to especially acknowledge um, some help that we've had for the past three lectures. Brian Chessman on sound, and Jill Sands, who has run video for us. So if you would, please. <laughs> Dan and Linda Lawson generously fund this lectureship named after Linda's father, Edwin Aiden. His 18 years of vocational ministry included ministries in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Kansas, and Missouri. He was on the faculty of Osaka Bible College and he taught courses in Bangladesh and Zimbabwe. It's a lot of unseen uh, funding that goes to support an event like this, funding that pays uh, the speaker to get here from where, where he's at and shelter him and feed him, but also the beautiful lunch that we had uh, today down in the fellowship hall and the dinners that faculty and students enjoy uh, with Dr. McKenzie. And we want to uh, thank Linda and Dan Lawson. Linda is here for their generous support that makes all of this uh, possible. Thank you. <laughs> it has been a delight to have with us Stephen L. McKenzie, professor of Hebrew Bible and Old Testament at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee. Steve has invited us to consider the wit and the wisdom of Jonah, its intended message, and also its textual challenges, and the creative interpretation that those challenges make possible. Like me, you have probably appreciated the way Steve's approach to Jonah highlights its rich details, but also its comic and satiric attitude while also expanding our imagination around the humor and what might say even surprise of God. We welcome him now to give his third and final lecture entitled Jonah's Psalm. And before he begins, we will have a short reading from the book of Jonah. Jonah chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All of your waves and your billows passed over me. And then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. As my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. Those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to the fish, and it spewed Jonah out upon the dry land. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mary, and uh, thank you, Sam. Let me say again uh, a note of appreciation to Linda, certainly, and um, Family, but also to all of you for your uh, very warm hospitality. So this is the last time I said, oh, I'm going to let go. And you never know what I'm going to say. So um, 
I was speaking before we began with Teresa Hayes here, and she um, said that she would have been impressed uh, by the depth of the question. I'm coming uh, particularly from the manual students, and, and I would echo that. Mm -hmm. um, but then I realized that that uh, provides an opportunity to have challenges here, because there's knowledge of the Bible, and then there's knowledge of the Bible. So um, we're going to start with a little quiz <laughs> to see what you really know, uh, or if, it's, if you really know the important things. <clears throat> so um, here's an only thing. Do you, do you know that there is a baseball in the Bible? Where? In the beginning, God is here. Yes, exactly. Okay. And what about motorcycles? David's triumph was heard throughout the land. Excellent. Yes. Uh, David's triumph was heard throughout the land. And cars. All the disciples were in one accord. Exactly. All the disciples were in one accord. And the case of transgender. The fish in Jonah. Absolutely. This is uh, uh, something that is uh, not well known because it doesn't appear in English. Um, but it's very clear in Hebrew. And so it's well known to translators and to biblical scholars. Um, this is not, it's not that somebody's trying to hide something from you, but it's a, it's a function of language. Um, Hebrew, like other languages you may know, uh, designates gender or indicates gender in the forms of its, of its noun. Okay? So for example, um, in Spanish, the Hebrew word for dog, not the Hebrew word for dog. <laughs> in Spanish, the word for dog is perro. But the word for female dog is panda. Yeah. The ending, o a designates gender. In English, um, there's no way to signal the difference in gender other than by coming up with a whole other word for female law. And we won't go there. <laughs> um, other than to say that he who has no word for female fish. But the fish in Jonah changes genders, not once in fact, but twice. Okay? So you see in, in Jonah chapter 2 verse 1 or 117, there's a difference between the Hebrew and the English. It's a masculine fish, a dog, because by the way, the Hebrew word for fish is dog. That's a masculine. And then the feminine is you, and you have an ah, just as in Spanish, and it's a da da. It's feminine. So in Jonah 2 1, uh, it's a masculine fish, a dog, that swallows Jonah. In the very next verse, it's a female fish from whose belly Jonah prays the olive. And then at the end of chapter 2, it's a masculine fish that um, vomits up Jonah on the dry leg. So it changes, the fish actually changes gender twice in Jonah. Quite a trick. Now, as you might guess, there have been a lot of attempts to uh, try to account for this linguistically, in other ways. My favorite uh, is a rabbinic explanation <laughs> that, um, that posits that Jonah was followed, was followed by uh, a male fish, but then he was just too comfortable. And so God transferred him to a female fish that was pregnant with all kinds of little fishes and fishy eggs. <laughs> and, uh, and so he was fed. And then once he had kind of learned his lesson, uh, God transferred him again. So that would explain the two, uh, two sets of ways, the two uh, different genders. For biblical scholars, the classic argument here is that this is one of the indications <coughs> I mean, that, um, that the psalm in Jonah is added later. That is, that whoever 
included this song and accommodated it to the narrative in Jonah, uh, referred to the fish as female, the Gaga, for whatever reason, later stage in the language or something like that. All of that to say, for the rest of this lecture, we're going to focus on the song uh, in Jonah. And I would suggest that the psalm in Jonah has its own compositional history apart from the narrative. Now this is fairly clear in a way if you look at the psalm carefully and notice that there's no reference in it to any of the characters or events in the story itself. There's no mention of the fish. There's no mention of the sailors or the ship. There's no mention of Jonah, for that matter, or of Nineveh. As it stands, it's a song of thanksgiving. <clears throat> That's a genre of song that we have uh, exemplified in the book of Psalm. And so this is a song of thanksgiving, but that doesn't really fit very well in the context. Because at this point in the story, Jonah doesn't know what he's doing to live his eye. So a close analysis of the psalm, using techniques that were developed in the analysis of Hebrew poetry and what's called Hebraic poetry, and I'll talk about that in a moment, um, suggests that the psalm is multi-layered. There is an older, original, version of the song that has been expanded um, into what we now have. So for the sake of uh, oh, one other one other uh, reference I should point out is that another indication of tension in the, in the song that suggests more than one layer is in verses six and seven. If you look at the end of verse six, it's uh, talking about Sheol its bars are closed behind me forever, but you brought up my life from the pit for the offering of God. Now, that's a conclusion. You saved me. You delivered me. But then as you keep reading, the very next verse, as I do think, I remember God. And psalmist is in crisis again, or still. So this suggests, again, uh, a multi layer two different layers in the song. And um, I want to show you our reconstruction. Uh, for the uh, sake of convenience, I'll refer to this reconstruction from the older layer as the poem, and then the work as we now have, the completed work as the song. All right? So, a reconstruction of the poem. I called out in my distress to Yahweh, and he answered me. From the valley of Sheol, I cried for help. You heard my voice. You threw me into the heart of the sea, or of sea, capitalized. River surrounded me. All your breakers and your waves swept over me. The waters encompass me to my very throat or life. I'll talk about that in a moment. Deep surrounded me. Extinction was bound to my head. At the bases of the mountains, I descended into the underworld, whose bars were behind me forever. But you brought up my life from the dead, or not from the earth. The psalm consists, or the poem, right, consists of couplets, right? And these are couplets that reflect different kinds of what's called parallelism. Saying, in, in sort of one, one classic type of parallelism, saying the same thing in two different ways, two different kinds of words. So for example, um, here, here, in deep time, you have waters encompassed by very deep so wide peaks around you. Right? Water is equal to deep. Encompassed in the surrounding. Um, and 
uh, the waters encompass me to my very own life and deep surrounding me. Now the reason for pointing out all of these correspondences um, in the poem is to, is to show that this is a very well sophisticated, structured document. Okay? And that in itself counters one of the explanations or theories that has been offered for the song in Jonah 2, which is that it is nothing but a random collection or pastiche of lines borrowed from the song. I think it's much more sophisticated than that, and you have these very nice correspondences. Right? In content, the poem combines two images. Uh, images of sea, S-E-A, and of death, both of which were Canaanite deities. A little background uh, in order to help understand this. Most of what we know of ancient Canaanite religion and Canaanite mythology comes from a site called the Dark. U-G-A-R-I-T, regard. This was a city-state along the Phoenician coast, uh, north of the modern-day country of Lebanon. It was discovered by accident in 1929, and then was excavated uh, throughout the 1930s. It was a site that thrived between 14, about 1400 BCE and about 1200 BCE. And um, when these texts, which were in a language that was previously unknown, and a language that was strange in the way it was written because it's alphabetic, but it uses cuneiform, the, the symbol used to write um, Syrian, Babylonian, which are not alphabet, but it's an interesting kind of hybrid. When the language was first deciphered and uh, translated, these texts were translated, it became obvious that they bore a great deal of similarity in phraseology, in vocabulary, and so on, to biblical Hebrew. And so they help us to understand a lot of the references in the Hebrew Bible that were previously unknown. Or they, they give background information and depth to some of those things. For example, uh, the many references to the God Paul. Uh, before the Ugaritic text, we really didn't know a lot, I mean, we could tell from the biblical uh, references that Paul was a uh, God. Non-Israelite, but you didn't really know a lot of the backstory, and you guys don't let it into it. Ugaritic uh, mythology is um, uh, a mythology that's very similar to, in some ways, to a better known Roman and Greek mythology. For example, there's a three-part universe. Um, there is the god of the sea. Just as you have Poseidon or Neptune, Poseidon, Greek, Neptune, uh, Latin, or Roman. The god of the sea in um, Ugaric is a god called Sea. No. Uh, and there's also, so in addition to the sea, there's an underworld. Uh, like in Greek or Roman mythology, uh, you have Pluto or Hades. Right? And in Ugaric, the god of the underworld is called Death. Not underworld. Not, you might take a stab at that. Okay, anyway. Um, and then uh, we have the god Baal, who is a storm god like Jupiter or Zeus. In fact, the name Paul simply means Lord and Master. Just like the god Zeus means God, Deity. Right? So, in the Ugaritic texts, uh, the god 
on C represents chaos. And um, Baal fights against C Yom, and defeats Yom, and then forms the universe and brings it into order. Or, as the word, uh, Greek word for order, cosmos. Right? Uh, Baal himself is later on swallowed by death. He goes down into the underworld and stays there for a brief time. We don't know for sure how long. Um, this is like the Greek myth of Persephone, which you may be familiar with. He goes into the underworld. The difference is that at Ugarit, we don't know if Baal's stay is connected with the seasons or not, as is the case with Persephone. Um, the entrance to the underworld is at the foot of the mountains, like Mount Olympus in Greek mythology which is also the location where the cosmic waters come together. The cosmic water is All right. All of that's just background. The Bible, however, preserved remnants of this mythology, especially in its poetry and its literature. One of the clearest examples of this is in Isaiah 51.9. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of Yahweh. Awake, and in the days of old, the generations of long ago, was it not you who cut Yahav in pieces, who pierced the dragon? Yahav is another name for sea. That's the name. Now, that doesn't mean that this writer in Isaiah uh, is not one of the this section of Isaiah, the writer may well be one of his. But liturgy and other facets of life are conservative. And other cultures, we often adopt things uh, that are the blood. I like to point out to my students, for example, that today is Tuesday, tomorrow is Wolverine's Day, and the day after that is Thor's Day. And a couple of days after that is Sunday and Moon Day. So in the names of the week, we perpetually, we, we continue uh, these mythological uh, terms. All right. So the Bible does this also in its uh, literature and, and in other of its uh, texts. All right. In Jonah's poem, sea, S-E-A, is also called river. And in the diet, one of the names for Yom is judgment. Same, same kind of language, same kind of ideology. Um, another term that's used in the poem for C uh, is the word deep. In uh, deep part. Deep. Well, deep is uh, a Hebrew word to home, which is probably cognate to the, the Babylonian goddess named Tiamat. Some of you may have read in the Middle East, the Babylonian creation story. And you remember reading about Tiamat, who appears to be the goddess of salt water and, and chaos. So we have a similar kind of thing in this older poem. The uh, poet in the poem describes sinking into the waters and then descending into Sheol, into the underworld, at the base of the mountains, just as in the great cosmology. The underworld is called Sheol and also called the pit. Jonah 2, this poem, envisions it, as you see in D5, um, as a, a city, an underworld city, where, uh, as cities uh, had in the ancient had gates that closed. The difference is that in ancient Israel cities, the gates served to 
keep invaders out. The gates of Sheol serve to keep the residents in. Okay. The biggest difference between the foreign in Jonah and New Greenwich mythology is that in the foreign in Jonah, neither sea nor death constitutes a threat to Yahweh. Because Yahweh reaches into the underworld and brings up the court from the underworld to the realm of death. Now, after the mention of Sheol in line B, oh, I'm sorry, um, couple of you, the poem then transitions into, after that you know, one reference, it transitions into a focus on C. There is a one reference to show, and then it, it moves into talking about uh, what C, S-E-A. Right? Um, and then the second half of the poem, the time of the poem, after the mention of the waters, indeed, in the first couple, then moves to talking about death. So it's, it's, it's using both of these, of these images. This transition from sea to death is facilitated by two double entendres, two uh, uh, places where you have double meanings. And one of those is in one we find First line, throat or life. This is the Hebrew word nefesh, which is typically translated, I think, misleadingly as soul. Um, I don't think there's an idea soul in the Hebrew Bible, but that's very common. Uh, so, uh, it, and, and, and at its base, this word really refers to appetite or throat. Uh, and here it uh, is a, but, but it also means self or being. So here I think we have a, a, a lovely double entendre where the waters rise to the very neck of the psalmist, which also is life threatening. The other nice double entendre is in like a uh, uh, cup of C5, the word extinction. Uh, this is the word that is. Uh, usually translated, in fact, probably in all English versions that you can find, is rendered as uh, reeds, R-E-E-D-S. Uh, and what's going on here is that the Hebrew word for reed is suf, the Hebrew word for extinction, or en, is so. so. They're very, very similar. You see, there's only that one vowel uh, difference, slight uh, difference in vowel. But but what the, the term reeds here isn't entirely appropriate in Jonah because the reeds, soup, uh, that occur elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible always refer to reeds connected with Egypt or with the Nile, Egyptian water. Um, but, but, but for example, uh, you probably know that the Red Sea in the, in the Old Testament in the Bible is actually the Yom Suf, the Reed Sea. Um, somewhere in Egypt, presumably. Uh, here, though, in Jonah's poem, there's no other connection with Egypt. So that seemed a little out of place. But maybe what we have is the psalmist or, or poet conjuring both images of the end or extinction, but also of vegetation in the seawater, or something like that. I, I think it may be a double on the And there's a very nice article um, by Bernie Gatto, uh, where he <coughs> argues that, that this is really the extinction or end. That is also, by the way, the, yeah, I said that, the Greek meaning, the, the second meaning. All right. And so that, that those two uh, double on the I think, facilitate this transition moving from C, drowning, if you will, to underworld and death. Um, the scene, um, or, or to continue here, I'll say, the, the reference to 
the extinction being bound around the head of the poet, uh, may be envisioning chords of death, which are referred to in the Psalms. For example, Psalm 18, 4 and 5, the chords of death encompassed me, the torrents of perdition assailed me, the chords of Sheol entangled me, the snares of death confronted me. And the origin of this expression uh, is possibly the idea of shrouding the dead or entombment. And so this may be where that really comes from. Again, again, I would emphasize that this is a very well-crafted, very artful literary piece. The poem resembles classical Hebrew and Ugaritic poetry not only in its themes relating to sea and death, but also in its linguistic features. And I'm going to rattle off a list of these very briefly for those of you who may be familiar with them. First of all, the relative paucity of prose particles, like the Hebrew et, the marker of definite direct object, uh, doesn't typically appear in older Hebrew poetry or in Hebrew poetry. And uh, there is a uh, uh, lack of them, or a uh, few of them, in this, even in this poem. None of them in reconstruction. All right? Um, second, the nearly complete absence of the definite article, T-H-E, in English. Third, the nearly complete absence of the conjunction at the beginning, that, that is A and B M, of the conjunction at the beginning of Bible. And fourth, the use of the prefix conjugation, or the so-called imperfect in Hebrew, without Bob, to express past tense. Right? And this is, a, this is a, a something that reflects an older form in the development of Hebrew. The exact date of this older form <clears throat> is hard to determine. But a date during the Israelite monarchy, say 8th century perhaps, is plausible. What this means is that the older poem in, uh, in Jonah probably constitutes the oldest portion of the book of Jonah, even though it likely was inserted into the book at a later date. That said, remember that the poem that we just analyzed is a reconstruction of the older level of the psalm in Jonah 2. So we should take a, a look at the psalm. Uh, as it now stands. The parts in white are the poem, the parts in yellow are uh, additions in, in my view. Um, and we can talk about some of these. I already uh, mentioned, for example, verse 7, and the fact that verse 7 seems to be added because it describes the psalmist as still in crisis even though verse 6 resolved that crisis, with Yahweh rescuing the songs from the pit. Uh, another issue with regard to verse 7 is that it mentions the temple, the holy temple. But again, as you might recall from your Old Testament history, the temple was in Jerusalem, in the southern country of Judah. And the people of the northern country of Israel did not worship in Jerusalem, but had their own shrines to Yahweh. And Jonah is from Israel. So the mention of the temple is inappropriate for the character of Jonah. More to the point, though, uh, the reference to the temple is outside of the psalm's focus on rescue from crisis. At the same time, Take a look at verse 4. <clears throat> this is going to be tricky because now I'm going to contradict what I just said. <laughs> if you look at, at verse 4, it also contains a reference to the temple. You see? And so, for that reason, um, 
I would consider it uh, a later addition. And given particularly the second line of that verse, how will I again look uh, at your holy temple? The, psalm, the psalmist, it's not always translated that way, but the psalmist did, I think, envision actually seeing the temple again. And uh, I'm saying that that's not going to happen. Um, but, but, now having said that, the older poem, if you remember, is chiastic with the first uh, two verses basically matching, uh, that is verses two and three, matching verses five and six in, in terms of chiasm. And remember that, that the way chiasm works is that the crux is in the middle. So I would suggest that what we have here is uh, an example of editing and supplementation, but editing and supplementation that is done with as much artistry as the composition of the original. And that is the, what, the, what the editor is doing, is to uh, insert verse 4 so as to transform the focus of the poem now to exile. I mean, they've driven away from the presence of the temple. Ta taking this older piece of poetry and reframing it, recasting it, so that the crisis is changed from uh, a psalmist's uh, uh, catastrophe, whatever that may be, I'll say more about that one, to, um, to being driven from the community, being driven from the temple. The remaining two verses there are verses 8 and 9, and they are also somewhat out of place uh, in terms of the older form, I think. Verse 8 refers to worthless lies, which is an expression for idols. Um, the concern to deal with idol worshippers in the psalm, though, seems a little bit out of place in Jonah, given its favorable perspective on the sailors in chapter 1 and the people of Nineveh in chapter 4, or 3 and 4. This suggests that, um, that, that the additions to this poem were not made with the story of Jonah in mind, but were rather done independently, than perhaps previous to the prose story the narrative. It's not clear also in verse 8 of uh, those who guard both the flies exactly who is being imagined here. Is this Israelites or, 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 or Jews worshiping the God, or is it non Jews, non Israelites? Um, not entirely clear. These are, however, expressions that do occur in other uh, Thanksgiving songs and are part of this, of the transformation of this older poem into a psalm of Thanksgiving. And then we have the final line, which is, uh, again, kind of common in some of the songs, especially songs of Thanksgiving, uh, this doxology, salvation of all is not, which is common in the even in the end of the day. All right. Sometime after the completion of the supplemental verses, this entire song was inserted into the prose story of Jonah. The obvious reason for this was because of the soul of imagery of, of drought and doing that, uh, which seems to resemble Jonah's experience at the time of being in the sea before being swallowed by the fish. Although the indication that it, it is inserted is that um, at the time Jonah has already been swallowed by the fish, so it doesn't fit exactly not exactly what it should be in that sense. The insertion of a psalm that is reminiscent of some detail in the story is a rather common phenomenon in the Hebrew Bible. And it's a lot like when some experience in your life reminds you of a psalm, or the lyrics of a psalm. It might just be one line that, that reminds you of the whole psalm. So, a similar phenomenon going on here. A good example of this 
in the Bible is the so-called Song of Hannah in 1 Samuel 2, 1 through 10, which in turn influenced the Song of Mary um, in the New Testament, in the Elizabeth. The Song of Hannah, to judge from its content, is the psalm celebrating military victory. It has nothing to do with the birth of Hannah's son, Hannah. However, the psalm does contain the line, quote, the baron has born seven, but she who has many children is forlorn, end quote. And that fits perfectly with Hannah's situation. Whoever added the psalm in Jonah also included the, the brief introduction in Jonah chapter 2, verse 1, Yahweh, or sorry, Jonah prayed to Yahweh the God from the belly of the fish, which identified the psalm as a prayer on Jonah's lips. This is the single reference to the fish as female, um, which is another indication perhaps that the psalm with its introduction is inserted. Further consideration of the psalm shows the importance of literary study for biblical interpretation, specifically the significance of metaphor and how metaphor functions in the text. The older poem is a cry for rescue or deliverance from crisis, some nameless crisis. It shares with other songs, for example, 18.6 and 121, the line, In my distress, I called upon or cried out for Yahweh. The image of drowning and descent into the underworld is a common metaphor in the psalms for crisis or disaster. Again, to cite just a few examples, Psalm 42.7, Deep calls to deep at the thunder of your cataracts. All your waves and your billows have gone over you. Psalm 69, 1 and 2. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep fire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters, and the flood sweeps over me. Psalm 88, 6 and 7. You have put me in the depths of shell of the pit. In the regions dark in me, your wrath lies heavy upon me, you overwhelm me with all your ways. Notice there also you have a combination of death imagery and, and water imagery. Um, the crisis in these psalms is typically not stable. Right? It might be a near death experience, but it is not necessarily so. It might be depression. It might be something else. Right? It almost certainly is not drowning in every case, because that would mean that there's an awful lot of drowning uh, going on in the part of Israelites, you know, which is a bit strange for a country that doesn't really have a good force. Right? So, um, this is a metaphor. In the opening quatrain to uh, the Solomon of Jonah, you have the line. Um, uh, I called out to Yahweh in my distress, and he answered me. From the bowels of Sheol, I cried out for help, and he heard me. Again, cried out to Yahweh in my distress, parallels from the bowels of Sheol. So there you have imagery of death dying for this crisis. It's telling me, in my distress, in my crisis. Um, and, and crisis, therefore, is it's almost using extreme language uh, for this situation of being in uh, danger or distress of some kind or another. Of course, um, the language of law drowning, near drowning, and so on, as I already mentioned, is a, is a major reason why this song is included in Jonah 2. Uh, it, 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 it's the, the writer, it's the, uh, the psalmist or the editor, using um, artistry and toying with genre. Change, taking what was a, 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 a cry for help in distress and then adopting it to Jonah's situation of actually you know, being in, in the water. Uh, 
Uh, and so that's, that's, a, that's a lovely play on, on imagery, a lovely um, literary change. Unfortunately, this metaphor has often been misinterpreted with disastrous consequences. And here we're back to um, the issue that I talked about in the very first lecture. A stunning example is the commentary on Jonah in the Word series by Douglas Stewart. Stewart recognizes the metaphorical nature of the poetic image in Psalm. But then he asserts that in Jonah it must be understood as actual experience. Quote, this is a vivid, powerful metaphor for the sensation of dying, and it happens to be the sort of thing that literally did happen to Jonah. And he's right. It happened literally. It is a literary device. And it does not mean, uh, and should not be construed, as an actual history. And Stuart knows that. Because he just said, it's a metaphor. So he somehow adopts an arbitrary decision that in this one case, in the Psalm of Jonah, it reflects actual historical experience. The apologist, Henry Morris, whom some of you may know or know the name because he is the founder, one of the founders, of the Institute for Creation Research in uh, California and wrote um, uh, books uh, dealing with trying to defend the history of the flood story. He was actually a hydraulic engineer in Spain uh, and not a biblical scholar. But he wrote a book also called The Remarkable Journey of Jonah, in which he argues that the psalm describes Jonah's actual descent not only into the sea, but into hell itself. Right? Ignoring the metaphor in the psalm of Jonah is a gross interpretive error that robs the book of its beauty and its playfulness. Again, Morris is not trained as a biblical scholar, but Stewart is Harvard trained, and as I mentioned, he knows better. So why? What motivates these two gentlemen to adopt such a misleading interpretation? Both of them make clear in their writings that the main reason they do this is because they perceive it to be an issue of faith. The matter arises because of Matthew 12, 40, that we talked about um, last time, where Jesus refers to the sign of Jonah as the only sign that those requesting one would receive. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights, in the belly of the sea monster, and listen to that language, in the belly of the sea monster, um, so for three days and three nights the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. Now, first of all, it gives in Matthew to Jonah's sojourn in the fish and not to his experience in the sea that Jesus referred. Still, Stuart and Morris decide that Jesus' remarks require the whole story of Jonah to be restored. That, in fact, the history of Jesus' resurrection is dependent on Jonah having actually happened. <laughs> but surely this gets things backwards. The resurrection is a crucial event, whether Jonah happened or not. This is a misunderstanding of the way that metaphor and literature and indeed language and figures of speech work. Jesus certainly understood metaphor, as is clear from his use of parables. And when he tells the lawyer in, in Luke 2, 10, sorry, when he tells the lawyer in Luke 10, go and do likewise, the lawyer's compliance is not contingent on whether the good Samaritan story happens or not, or whether it is just a parable. What matters is the message. Go as we might find it in the name. As much as one may respect the faith commitment of Stuart and Morris, one 
uh, should never allow faith to inspire disingenuousness. I would suggest that their faith is misplaced in this instance, and that there is more to it than faith. That it is really about co-opting the Bible and its interpretation or control. My way or the highway. Their insistent interpretation represents and supports the use of Jonah as a litmus test to measure orthodoxy and to marginalize people who interpret it differently. So the Psalm of Jonah is a window into the process of, and this is in conclusion, she says, the Psalm of Jonah is a window into the process of composition behind biblical literature, and also a window into the richness of its artistry at multiple layers in that process. It's about the importance of understanding literary devices that we often skip over, like metaphor, and of being sensitive to the use and interplay of different genres, rather than assuming that every piece of literature in the Bible is an Perhaps most important, it's a lesson to us all about the importance of using the Bible honestly, with tolerance and humility in interpretation, and utmost caution before wielding the Bible to judge and condemn someone because they disagree with our interpretation. And I'm going to stop here, but I have to say one other thing. Um, just because that you know, I need to walk in the uh, um, And that is, you know, it's one thing to deal with Jonah, uh, a small, maybe even sort of obscure book in the Hebrew Bible, or, or maybe a novelist book in the Hebrew Bible. It's quite another when you start thinking about issues that are real in our day and time, political issues, social issues. And, um, and there's uh, an awful lot of argumentation that goes on by uh, people, and maybe on both sides of the issue, saying, you know, I believe this because the Bible says so. The Bible never says so. When somebody said, says that, what they're really saying is, my interpretation says this. My interpretation is this. And so I think we have to be very, very clear. Citing the Bible says so uh, in taking uh, any kind of position. But yes, conversation, great. Right. Um, and, and maybe conversation about interpretation, great. Right. But uh, let's be very careful about using the Bible.
afternoon lecture and the idea that um, some criticism relative to the animal kingdom is at play. And whether or not in the book of Shana, what we have here is hyperbole, or maybe some collective perspective on the world of order relative to the mentality.
And so Jonah, going to Nineveh, um, illustrates that, that principle. Um, and, and so then, you know, I think the, the, the second writer then takes that and, and mushrooms the story into the problem. Who knows? Who knows? Perhaps God will. Yeah. yeah I, I, 
I, uh, so the question is about the, the king's edict and the response that follows. Oh, it's never that. Um, uh, I think it's the, it's the, uh, I remember, but I think it's the people who are doing this. The, the, this is expressing their motivation for their, their repentance. The final, the final verb is, uh, he's, a, he's a first person for we, we might, you know, that we might be saved or something like that. I believe that's right. But, but before that, it's just been kind of a, kind of a first person. It is, it is. It's technical. And it's not altogether clear, even with the king being a dinner, he's saying that. Is it the king? Is it the people? Is it the murder? Dr. Lowers. I just want to follow up a little bit on the question that I asked last night. Um, I, and I'd like to push you a little bit theologically on the song of doing because it does uh, significantly impact the history of the some of the commentators, early Christians, one of them, they spend more time in that. But uh, what, what is the purpose of that? Granted, it's, it's a vision, it's a labor of vision. Uh, what's its function overall? What we, what, how does it help us to interpret the whole set? Oh, no. <laughs> So the, the question there was uh, about the purpose of the song, given that it's redacted um, in later. So that's a great question. Um, uh, you know, there is, of course, initially the idea of it being simply coming to life, or simply being in the water. Um, and uh, you know, a song of thanksgiving, um, which isn't entirely appropriate. Um, I'm not sure, I, I suppose it colors Jonah's character in a way that, I mean, it's a great question because you're making me think about it in a way that's different than I have usually thought about. It. I, I've usually thought about all this in addition, but it doesn't fit. So you're turning that around your head, you're trying to get me to think about it in terms of how it does work or how it does work in the, in the context. Um, and I'm going to have to think about that some more because I'm not sure I can really come up with it. Maybe it's just a, because, you know, I've been illustrated it's a little bit kind of hard to learn certain things. And, uh, so maybe it's just that I haven't given enough consideration that uh, I've seen how it would really work in the whole uh, work, but it just really jumps out to me as something that doesn't. Maybe you can fill in some of what the whole yeah. Christian the, the interesting thing is I've done a little bit of work on Max and Kitty Fester. Thank you. 
just sort of waiting for some kind of so so there's a lot of struggle with that as well. Maybe John can work. You've already mentioned other places where expectations are people who turn to the book, like the very beginning of the book. My experience is that students and others when they come to chapter two assume they're gonna get solved. And they generally read it as a penitential psalm, even though, as you know, it's a Thanksgiving psalm. In the story, John brings this from sort of inside the fish. Inside the fish, he's giving thanks. And so the question that then becomes in the story world of Jonah, why is he giving thanks for the fish? Everything he's describing, the stress he's describing, is all past tense. That's the nature of that. That you're thanking God for having rescued from people in distress. So in the story world of Jonah, Jonah has been rescued from distress. He's thanking God for doing that while he's in the I that's the direction I have to go to try to figure out how to solve the question. That's why it's not going to I'm going to try to read that. <laughs> Thank you. 
well be something that would uh, be worth doing in the Czech Republic. I don't think. Dr. McKenzie, stepping back from the DNA and the genome and the genome details of the book, from the wider lens, when you look at the redacted and layered artistry of the book, how do you understand, um, in its final form, the perspective presented about Yahweh, Yahweh's character, and how Yahweh interacts with the world, especially given these interreligious um, components of the song that you mentioned? Oh, that's a that's a, a brilliant question. Um, and and it's, it, it's one of the things that, that we were also talking about um, at lunch. Um, one of the things I like so much about the book, frankly, is that I, I don't see that there is a straightforward. No, I don't see that there's a straightforward uh, answer to that question. In other words, I think it. It kind of goes back to the issue of mercy and justice that, that I mentioned last night. Is, is, is Yahweh, um, I don't know how you say it this way, but in some ways is Yahweh a good guy or a bad guy? Is, it, you know, is, is Yahweh's uh, forgiveness of Nineveh justified? Is it fair? Is it just? And another dimension to that that, that we were talking about um, as I said, much another another approach to Jonah, another method, has been that of what's called post-colonial, post-colonial, uh, post-colonialist uh, approach. And if you read post-colonial treatments of uh, Jonah, they're uh, in some ways they're all over the place. They take different viewpoints. Um, is and, and one of those viewpoints is that. Um, that it's not as much Nineveh that's sort of the uh, colonialist power as it is Yahweh. Um, that that, that uh, Yahweh is the one who you know who, who, who holds all the cards, and Yahweh is the one who uh, makes all of the decisions. And um, and you know, in the case of justice and mercy, is that decision arbitrary? Um, so. Um, it, it's a great question, and as, and with, as with so much interpretation, I think it really depends on where you come from and where you're coming from. Um, you know, with 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 um, the, 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 the different kinds of interpretive methods that are available. A lot of those, particularly in the last twenty or thirty years, are um, interpretations that um, that. Yeah, Focus on what's sometimes called, uh, in, in, from Paul Nakuda, the uh, world in front of the text. So the interaction of the reader with the text, um, whether that reader is uh, feminine or masculine, white or uh, or a different ethnicity, black, Hispanic, so on. So it depends on your your social location on how you read the text, and. and um, Jonah, it seems to me, is, uh, is, is uh, a great illustration of, of the fact that it depends a lot on where you're at. I think the idea of that way uh, is kind of wide open. Yeah. All right, let's leave it there. Um, if you would, please uh, stand for our closing prayer. I'm going to invite the man to talk to you just to go out of the for some photos. Some gesture of gratitude, some gesture that signals gratitude, and extend that gesture of gratitude to Dr. McKenzie. And let him catch your eye and understand your thanks. And Dr. McKenzie, if you would, thank your audience. And now go under the sign of Jonah, whether you find yourself at the city gate, or in the belly of the whale, or under the shadow of the plant. May you be surprised by a God of wit 
and humor, and especially mercy. Go in peace.